Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be together once again. If you uh, go ahead and have a seat, please. Want to just say a, a huge warm welcome to all of you. Thanks for being here today. If you are uh, new to us, especially want to welcome you. My name's Todd. Would love the chance to meet you. And uh, being somebody who maybe is new to our church, or maybe the last couple of weeks you've been new, um, we just want you to know that we want to connect with you. We want to make this church a little bit more personal to you by helping answer any questions you might have about this church or how to get connected to it. And so you can do that in a number of ways. They're up on the screen and they're in your bulletin. You can scan a code, you can send us a text, you can send us an email, or the old-fashioned way of actually walking out the doors to our Next Steps area, meeting one of our volunteers out there and filling out a card. Um, but we are so glad that you're here if you are new. Couple things that I wanna let you know about in the life of the church coming up. Uh, the first one is that tonight, I told you about this last week, but we're gonna be introducing the church to a ministry called Project SOS. It is a ministry uh, for women who have faced unwanted and unplanned pregnancies, and it is a great ministry to uh, kind of address the abortion crisis in our country. If you are interested in being a part of that or knowing how you can serve, come tonight at 6.30 p.m. right here in the Worship Center. We'd love to have you. Second thing is we love our students here, and we've got a great event coming up next Saturday. The middle school students are all going to Kalahari, all right? So who wouldn't want to be a part of that trip if you're a middle school student? Um, and if you have middle school kids that you know you want to get plugged in, or maybe friends in the neighborhood that you're interested in seeing how they could plug in, please get on our website, and you can, uh, and you can sign up for that event, all right? All right, so... We are going to transition now. Oh, let me tell you this. One of the ways that we worship here is through giving, giving out of what God has given to us. We don't talk about giving a whole lot here. And one of the reasons we do that is because giving is really reserved for those who know and trust this ministry. And so if you're new to us, uh, we don't expect you to give. Uh, we expect you to get to know us and trust us before you would give to us. But if you are a part of this church and call this place home uh, and you've come prepared to give, uh, we don't pass a plate. The gift boxes are in the back so you can place your gift in there on the way out. But we're thankful so much for the way our church gives and the generosity that you display, all right? All right, we are going to shift into a really great thing. You hear those extra noises in our service today because it is baby dedication day. All right, which is very fun. We have six families that are dedicating kids to the Lord today. Three in this service, three in the next service. So without kind of further ado, I'm going to actually read off the names of those who are dedicating, and I'm going to have them come up as, they read, as I read off their names, and then uh, I'll, I'll go from there. All right, Hunter and Corinne Nicewander are bringing Emmy Ray. Nicewander, come on up. Emmy Ray. And you're going to see some, some great pictures up there if you don't get a, a great look. All right. Chris and Jillian Polly bring Caitlin Elizabeth Polly. Come on up. There's Caitlin. All right. And then uh, Tom and Renee Wyrick. Bring Jenna Christine Wyrick and the rest of their crew. Come on up. All right. I love this Sunday for one because of all the, the extreme cuteness on the stage, but also you never know what's going to happen this Sunday with these kids, and I love that. Um, Listen, parents, I'm going to talk to the parents for a second, then I'm going to talk to you as the church, because we all play a role in this, and I'll explain why that is. But first, uh, parents, I want you to know that today, you all are, are making a, a commitment to something today. We call this a baby dedication, but really we should probably call it a parent dedication. It's really a, a parent commissioning service, because it's the parents that are making the big commitment today, not the kids. And this is what you're saying today, parents. You are declaring that God has given you an amazing gift in your child. 
And today, what you are saying is you are dedicating that gift back to God. And in doing so, it really begins to change and transform the way you raise them and the way you bring them up. At this church, we have like six motives or values that we try to kind of live by. One of those is build the family. We believe that God's original plan for discipleship was supposed to happen through the family unit. And so what we believe is that you as the parents are the primary influences on your kid's life. The primary responsibility to disciple your kids, to teach them about Jesus, to model it to them, falls on you as the parents. The cool thing is you're not alone in this because you have this amazing extended family called Silver Creek Church that wants to come alongside of you and point your kids to Jesus and partner with you in doing that. And uh, she's waving. I love it. She is like soaking this up. <laughs> so, I got nothing more to say. <laughs> Listen, I, uh, I want you to know, too, that as parents, your job is certainly to protect these kids. And that's a big part of your job, but a huge part of your job is to prepare them to live for Jesus even outside of the home. It's hard to imagine this, but they will spend most of their life outside of your home, which means that your job is to prepare them really well for that. And they are gonna be growing up in a culture where following Jesus is not the norm. It's not the popular thing to do, and our culture is gonna do everything possible to try to pull them away from Jesus. But it's your responsibility in partnership with the church to always be laying the foundation and pointing them back to Christ. Proverbs 22.6 says this. This is a great verse for the day. We'll put it up there. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, or she is old, he will not depart from it. And that is the, the calling and the commitment that you're making today. But here's what I want you to know. Above all, you as parents do not have the power to save your kids. Only Jesus has the power to do that. And I want you to know that the best thing you can do as a parent is to lean on the Holy Spirit's power, yielding your child to Christ in his saving work and seeing what only he can do. And my prayer, and I know as along with your prayer, that one day your kids will make a decision to follow Jesus with their lives. That's what we're dedicating them to today, all right? You are instruments to that end. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, talk to the church because, church, you guys have a responsibility in this too. You're going to be the ones that uh, you're going to watch these kids grow up. You're going to see them run past you in the hallways. You're going to be their teachers back in the kids' ministry, their small group leaders, their mentors. And I believe, I know we all have a responsibility in this. And we want you to be encouraged to actually be a part of the process of discipleship with these kids. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the families to make a commitment. Then I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. So parents, first of all, I'm going to ask you three questions. And if you intend to do the three things that I ask you to do, you're going to respond, we do. Right? Parents, do you recognize that your child is a gift from God who deserves your genuine thanks? Do you dedicate your child to God and promise through your words and actions to raise your child in a way that points them to Jesus? And while it is God who saves them, will you take very seriously your biblical responsibility to create an environment where they can discover life in Jesus? If you agree, parents, please say we do. We do. All right. And church, you have a commitment to make as well. If you intend to partner with these families, go ahead and listen to this commitment. And if you're going to participate, I'm going to ask you to respond. We do. As a representation of the body of Christ, will you fulfill your responsibility to pray for these families, to model godliness, and to make sure all of your instruction accurately communicates the truth of Jesus according to God's word? If this is true of you, please respond. We do. All right. Well, listen, what I want to do is I'm going to pray over these families now, and then we're going to worship. 
I'm going to ask that you stay seated during the first song, and I'm going to pray individually with each of these families and dedicate them to the Lord. All right, pray with me now. Father, I thank you so much for each one of these families. Lord, today they are making a great decision, a decision that unfortunately not enough people make to say we want to raise our child to know Jesus and to lay a foundation that never ends. And so, Lord, I dedicate each of these kids to you today. And I pray that these parents, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would lean on you and trust in Jesus to do all the heavy lifting and that they would just be instruments in your hand to be used by you as they parent their kids. Give them energy and love and compassion and joy as they bring these kids up. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. No matter where I run, I'm not far from home. Yeah, I may be weak, 
but you're able Even when I'm not You're faithful Where can I hide from your spirit? Where can I hide from your face? Where can I flee from your presence? Where would I go? Where would I go? If I rise to the heavens to me If I fall to the depths of the sea Even there it's you
I take a second and pray with me. God, thanks for making us free. Thanks for taking what we could not bear. And God, we pray that you would, you would open our hearts and minds to hear your word this morning, God. Show us something new. Reveal yourself to us in a new way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, Silver Creek Church. Again, just want to welcome you here. Excited that you've joined us this morning. Uh, my name is Pastor Dan, and I have the privilege to serve here as the associate pastor as we continue our series called Rugged Hope, as we've been journeying, journeying through First Peter. And uh, we're excited to continue that today. We actually see some really neat uh, kind of changes in what Peter is going to address as he kind of takes this hope that we've been born into, this hope that's found on Jesus and what he's done on the cross and actually starts putting it into practice in our life and what it looks like. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll be in there. It will be on the screen behind me, but do want to extend that invitation if you have a Bible with you this morning. Uh, growing up, just like everybody else, I had a favorite movie. Now, this movie uh, translated into my adult years and still is one of my favorite movies of all time. A movie that I would watch if I wanted just kind of for nostalgia's sake or if I wanted some good entertainment. And this movie is the 1984 version of The Karate Kid. Anybody else with me, Karate Kid? Like, eh, I can get behind that, a handful of people. This has been kind of made a little bit more popular uh, with the Netflix series uh, Cobra Kai, which I cannot endorse because I have never seen it, which is surprising for somebody, I guess, who loves Karate Kid. But I love that movie growing up. I wore our VHS tape out. Uh, if you are younger than 25, you're like, what the heck is a VHS tape? But that's okay. I wore that thing out, and I would watch that movie over and over again, practicing the karate moves so that I could be like daniel son, you know, be learning karate from Mr. Miyagi. I actually once had the tape taken from me by my parents because I was practicing the moves on my younger brother. <laughs> would not advise that, you know whatever it may be. But there's one scene in that movie that uh, as I kind of prepared for the message today, just kind of got brought, I believe, to my mind as I think about what kind of Peter is trying to formulate here in this passage. It's a scene where uh, Daniel and Mr. Miyagi are out on the water in a rowboat. You may remember this. And Mr. Miyagi is kind of his, his uh, sensei, if you might say. He's teaching him the ways of karate. And he has Daniel standing on the bow of this little rowboat, which is not a great foundation, right? He's moving all over the place. And he tells him to kind of practice some of his moves. And he's doing, you know, wax on, wax off, paint the fence, you know, uh, sand the floor, you know, all those things. And Daniel the whole time is like, I, when am I going to learn to punch? I want to learn to punch. And uh, Mr. Miyagi is, is explaining to him, hey, you have to learn these, this foundation. You have to learn balance because if you don't have balance, you might as well just go pack your bags and go home. Sure enough, as uh, Daniel keeps begging and begging, he kind of rocks the boat and Daniel goes overboard into the water. Of course, Mr. Miyagi thinks it's hilarious. When we think about what Peter is kind of building a case for in this book, He's explaining that this hope we have in Jesus can be a rugged hope because it serves as a firm foundation for our walk with Christ and a firm foundation for us as we face different things in life that when the boat is rocked, right, by the coming storm, if we're not shaken back and forth like someone standing on a rowboat, but we are set on solid, firm ground on a foundation of a hope that will last for eternity. Because what Jesus has done on the cross is something that's final. It is done and gives us a hope, not just in the present time, but also for the future. And so uh, what Peter's going to do is he's going to kind of move from what Jesus has done suffering on the cross for us. And then now kind of brings it into this is what it's going to look like in your life if you stand on this firm foundation, living out your hope in Jesus Christ, that even in the midst of suffering or difficult seasons or pain, that you would be able to have your balance and not fall and not stumble and find yourself continuing following him. So in 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to look through the entire chapter, it kind of highlights uh, in it, and three things we're going to find here is that first is that with a foundation built on this living hope, that we can worship 
not wander. That we can, two, contribute, not consume. And number three, we can rejoice, not reject. And so let's dive into the first one here. Number one, worship, not wander. This, you're probably familiar with these terms if you're familiar with some of the classic hymns, this idea of, of we are being called to worship, but we are prone as, as sinful, you know, like people with a sin nature, prone to wander from the things of God and to pursue the things in our broken hearts. And uh, we, once we've been set free, right, and placed our faith in Jesus, that we are now free from that sin and we are free to worship God, not wander from him. Uh, Peter addresses this in verses 1 and 2. He says this, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For, for, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And so we see kind of two ways of living here presented to us by Peter. There is a set of people that are living uh, by their human passions, by their flesh, by their sin nature, and those who are living by the will of God. Those who are worshiping with their life and those who are wandering from God. And we see Peter building a case for this. He says, since Christ suffered, right? He went to the cross. He died on the cross for our sins, lived a perfect life, that if we place our faith with him, we are set free and made new through him, uh, and that we are free from sin so that we don't have to be bound by it any longer. We've been set free to worship. And yet so many believers find themselves still uh, kind of tied to their human passions, their, their, their flesh by the sin nature that oftentimes confuses us and leads us to wander away from God. Peter is essentially saying, hey, you need to arm yourself with the same thinking of Christ. That the one who was in full obedience to the Father, who lived a sinless life and even obeyed to the point of death, a painful death on the cross, so that God's will would be fulfilled. He's saying that you have ceased to sin, meaning that your, your ties to it are no longer there. And so you should not be, not be living by your human passions, but living by the will of God. And it, this is so countercultural because people that, that live like out of the human passions will say things like this. They say, I, you know, with this worldview, they'll say, hey, whatever makes you happy, whatever gives you the most joy in life, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, it's not a big deal. It says, what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. And then untapped uh, human passions will go down a road wandering away from God and his word to pursue things of this world instead of pursuing God and worshiping him. We as believers are called to live not according to our passions and our desires and, and what we feel is in our heart okay, but we should pursue it by knowing and seeing what the will of God is. In fact, the Bible even tells us if we were to live out of you know, our heart and our passions and our desires, that it can be dangerous. The Bible tells us that the heart is deceptive above all else. Who can trust it? And so like, if you think about it, if you're functioning out of your heart and your human passions, you know, what, what you're living today might be different even tomorrow with the change of your mood and a change of your emotions and change of your opinion that ultimately the truth can change waver. We don't see that to be the case in scripture, we see this call to live by the will of God. And the way we know the will of God is that we are to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking as Christ. It's a battle not so much of the heart because we know God's already got our heart. It's more of a battle of the mind that we are to put on the same mind of Christ, being obedient to God in his word. We actually see something similar in scripture in Romans chapter 12 verses 2 where Paul kind of speaks to the Romans and he tells them, he says, do not be conformed to this world, right? Don't conform to what you see going on in the world around you, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That we need to renew our minds, putting on the mind of Christ in order for us to, to no longer live, right, as wanderers, but to live as worshipers that are obedient to God and his word. 
the most amazing thing here is that God has not left us with, with this wondering of what his will is. He has given us his word, the Bible, so that we know how he has worked throughout human history and what he calls us to, and how he calls us to live even now. Um, I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon because I think this speaks um, to, you know, kind of what we're even seeing in our culture today. Now, what you need to know about Charles Spurgeon is he was a pastor over 100 years ago. And so he's speaking about his culture uh, at a time, uh, you know, 100 years ago in a different, you know, season, a different culture, a different society. And yet it still seems to ring true because we know that sin is still prevalent in this world. We know that brokenness is uh, still there. This is what he says. He says, to some, the teaching of Scripture, talking about the Bible, is not f- of final authority. Their inner consciousness, their culture, or some other unknown uh, quantity is their fixed point, if they have a fixed point anywhere. The fount of inspiration is not now within the book, speaking of the Bible, and with the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, but within man's own uh, intelligence. We have no longer, thus says the Lord, but thus saith modern thought. And we see some very similar thinking in our culture today. And we as believers have been called to live not according to our human passions, but by the will of God. And if we want to do that, we need a renewing of our mind that only takes place through understanding, knowing, and obeying God's word. If I had somebody here today and they said, hey, I just want to hear from God, my first question would be, have you read your Bible? Because if we want to hear a word from the Lord that we need to go to the word of God to receive that and understand and to know how God is calling us to live. Peter goes on to say this. He says, for the verse three and four says, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. He's saying like, hey, your time to live in sin and live out your human passions, that, that time is, has, has come and gone. You're now a part of Christ's family. You've been brought, brought in, made new. He says, now, you know, you're called to do something different. But he gives this kind of long list of, of kind of what the Gentiles were known for doing at this time in their culture when untapped human passions were unchecked, right? It says, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. He says this, with the respect to these, uh, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, meaning they speak ill of you, that they're rude to you, that they call you out, and they call out your behavior, and because they're surprised that you're not willing to, to join in with them and do the things that they do, that they're going to respond to that by speaking ill of you. And I'm telling you right now, if you live uh, out the will of God in your life, as a worshiper, not a wanderer, people are going to take notice and people might say things to you. This is a light version of it, but I, you may uh, remember in high school, back in the day, right? If I think back 20 plus years ago, back when I was in high school, we used to play this game is Never Have I Ever. And it's a game that a lot of student ministries will play, and, and I'm sure it's still somewhat uh, relevant. But we would play this game, and, you know, when we had some dead time in class where you'd put, you know, kind of five fingers up. And if someone would say, I've never, I, never have I ever, and they kind of mention something they've never done. And if you have done it, you'd put a finger down. And so someone who uh, grew up in the church and came to faith at a young age, and I was a good uh, church boy, um, there is a lot of things that I've never done. And so I would play with my friends, and pretty much every single time I would win. And because they would name off all of these crazy things, things that are not of God, and people would be putting their fingers down left and right. And then uh, I almost gained like a reputation of the good Christian boy, right? Um, They named my vehicle in high school the Christmobile. I drove a nice 86 Mercury Sable wagon. Uh, It was an LX. (laughs) Just want to throw that out there. And uh, it was a, the Christmobile, right? I even had uh, my senior year in my yearbook and some notes that people had wrote to me. They called me their, their little board again Christian, you know? Like, and like people are surprised when you're not willing to do the things that they do. And you might not have the same past as I do, but certainly now as someone who's come to faith, there are things that you're choosing not to do because you're a follower of Jesus, There's things that you're choosing not to celebrate, not to participate in, not to walk with. And people are going to take notice of those things. And as a result, even if you speak truth in the most loving way as possible and live your convictions out, people will take notice. And as a result, it will cost you some some things. And one of those things might be the way that people 
treat you, the way they talk to you, the way that they interact with you. But we still have been called to be worshipers, to live by the will of God, not by our human passions. And so we are to be called worshipers, not wanderers. And we can only do that when we stand on the foundation of the hope that we have in Jesus. Number two, uh, contribute, not consume. We've been called to contribute, not consume. Uh, verse 7 of First Peter chapter 4 says this, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Peter is telling them essentially like Jesus is, is returning at some point. In the meantime, be self-controlled, be disciplined, stick to the things that you know are good, and be sober-minded. Don't allow your emotions to take over. Don't allow other substance to control your mind. Be sober-minded. Have this mind of Christ that is not affected by other things around you, and so that your prayers, right, for the sake of your prayers... And I, I just believe in general, when we are in an unhealthy place, we become consumers. Like when my, I'm having a bad day, do you know what I like to consume? Food. I love me some food, right? I'm an emotional eater. Uh, in fact, my guilty pleasure is Taco Bell. Don't judge. It's a safe place here. Safe place. And based on how my day is going, you know, and I struggled a little bit more, you know, when I was a little bit younger than I do now, but I still, not gonna lie, my wife can confirm that I still sometimes will crave Taco Bell. In fact, depending on how I feel about this message, I may be stopping there on the way home <laughs> today. But when I'm in an unhealthy space, like emotionally undisciplined, uh, I'm not sober-minded, I'm not kind of settled, even in my emotions and my feelings, I oftentimes can lead us to do things we know are unhealthy. You know, that, that being on an all Taco Bell diet is not going to do well for me. It's just not. In the same way, in our walk with Christ, when we are in an unhealthy state, we can be very, like, consumer-oriented, right? And that plays out oftentimes in the church. You know, when you're, someone's coming to the church and they're, they're, as a consumer, they're, they're looking at worship and asking themselves, was it, was it good today? Did, did uh, you know, all the lyrics come up on the screen right? Were the, the singers on point? Did, was, was there this, this nice build toward the end that got this emotional appeal to it? You know, you're, you're, you're looking at the message and saying, hey, did it feed me? Did it, was there good stuff to it? Was it funny? You know, was the, the pastor funny? Which I'll guarantee you, I'm only funny about 80% of the time. Um, you know, you're asking yourself, like, hey, did I find a good parking spot? Is there a good space for me to sit? You know, did, was I greeted at the door? And this checklist comes down of saying, hey, really it's this mindset of saying the church exists for me and to serve me and my needs. And I believe when we're in a healthy space, right, when we're self-controlled, disciplined, sober-minded, and we have the mind of Christ, that we won't be consumers, but we would be contributors, because once we enter into a relationship with God, we are brought in his family and we are given a church family where he calls us to be a part of, to live out our faith, not as individuals, but in a community. Uh, kind of Peter kind of expels what this looks out here in uh, verses 8 through 10. He says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. We see three things that he kind of points out here of what it looks like to be a contributor, not just a consumer. One, he says that we are called to love one another. Even saying that when you love the way that Christ has loved you, that it covers up a multitude of sin. Why? Because when you love the way that Christ loves, like that your, your relationships are marked by forgiveness, marked by grace, marked by the, the representation that we see of Jesus even sacrificing of himself for us. And the truth is, it's, it's interesting. I, I think sometimes it's so hard for us to forgive because we feel like, you know, that, that yes, we want to love people, but we still want to hold people accountable. But I think it's true that if we love the way that Jesus has loved us, it helps us to forgive better, right? Because I don't think you'll ever, you will never have to forgive somebody as much as Jesus has forgiven you, right? So if we understand, right, that the amount that Jesus had to forgive us, it allows us in relationship with others to forgive and to love and to show grace. And uh, then he goes on from loving one another to show hospitality. It's the idea of inviting people into your life and into your home, most of which aren't in your immediate circle of friends or relationships. That we are to show hospitality. It says, without grumbling, right? 
And I know how hard it is sometimes to open up our homes and open up our lives to people because uh, our homes and our lives are not perfect, right? You're inviting people in to see your mess. You know, a lot of us, right, when someone comes over, you'll sweep the floors and move all your junk into another room or into a closet and you want to hide it. But the more you show hospitality, the more people are going to see your mess. And that's the true of our lives. When we open ourselves up to other people, they're going to see our mess. But that's okay because Jesus has seen ours and he loved us anyways and ultimately even died for that mess to be forgiven and cleaned up so that we can go before a holy God and have a relationship with him. Last, it says to serve one another. We contribute when we serve one another. That, you know, even it's, Peter says that each of us has received a gift, and that gift is to be used to serve one another. This can be kind of an organic thing, right? When you're in relationship with other and you're seeing need and you respond, or it can be a little bit more formal where you join uh, our church in, in one of our ministry teams to serve in some capacity in some way. I love uh, our church here at Silver Creek because we have many opportunities to get plugged in, uh, to, to kind of contribute, right? One of those is through our community groups. We, we desire to get all people connected in a community group, and it's a growing ministry, and I'll be honest with you, we could use more groups as, as the interests continue to grow and grow and grow, and uh, we want to connect people in those communities so that they can experience these things of God. But also, we have several opportunities to serve on a ministry team, whether it's through worship, whether it's through greeting, and uh, whether it's through you know, children's ministry, student ministry, you know, parking team. We've got a shuttle that even runs back and forth from the movie theater you know, to kind of some of our staff that's here all day and our people that are here all day can park off site to open up spaces for guests and that we have the opportunity for people to kind of come and, and, and find spaces here without having to fight for one. We want those opportunities to be there because we believe that God has created you and gifted you to serve. And part of that is your way of standing on this foundation of hope in Jesus, where you're no longer looking at yourself and saying life is all about me, but you're looking at others. This is the same mind of Christ. Mark chapter 10, verses 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We want to put on the mind of Christ. We won't look to see our needs as a consumer and make those the primary thing, but we'll look to say, hey, how can we serve God and serve others? Brings us to the last one, number three. Rejoice, not reject. Rejoice, not, uh, not reject. I think this explains itself in these next passages. Verses 12 and 13, it says this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you are, uh, share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. What he's saying here is essentially, it says when trials and tribulations, when, when suffering comes, when persecution comes, when those seasons of life get hard, don't be surprised by it as if something strange were happening. Instead, rejoice. Rejoice that we get to share, right, in the suffering of Christ. Rejoice that, you know, once we get through it, that we might see the glory of God revealed. This is a complete game changer in our mindset, right, when we go through hard things, because I believe there's people, uh, and likely in this room, that believe that as a Christian, someone who lives for God, that you are now exempt from all difficult things in life. There's preachers that will preach that. That, hey, if you, if you love God and, and you are an active member of our church and you give in all these things, you'll never suffer. You'll never have any medical issues. You know, all of your finances will be taken care of. We don't see that gospel in the scriptures at all. In fact, we are called into suffering just like Christ. And that there's actually benefit to it. And so if we think it won't come, you know, it's almost as like, uh, I don't know if this happens in your household. The older my, my wife and I get, you know, around Christmas time, there's certain things that we want for Christmas. And so sometimes, or birthdays, and we'll buy them for ourselves and then we'll wrap them like we know they're coming, right? Imagine doing that, you know, so we at least have something to open up on our birthdays around Christmas. And so imagine opening something up and pretending to be surprised, and we try to for the kids, but it's kind of silly, right? I know I'm getting this pair of socks, you know, oh, not that that's on my list this year. <laughs> but like, it's kind of crazy to think about it. And Peter's saying the same thing. It's not a matter of if you will experience difficult times and suffering. It's a matter of when. 
So don't be like, you know, the, 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 the crazy person that knows what they're getting for their birthday and acts surprised. But know that it's coming and be prepared. I think for those who don't expect it, when it comes, the response is rejection. To say, this is not good. This is not what's supposed to happen. They start questioning God. Is God really a good God? And they reject the opportunity that God gives them to, to kind of walk through that suffering in the same way that Christ walked through it, to get on the other side of it and see growth in their life and walk with Jesus. In fact, uh, we know in, in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 3, it kind of talks about this, where it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. There's truth here. When we experience suffering or persecution or hard times in our life, when we kind of walk with God through those things, and when we get on the other side, we realize that there's been growth, there's been faithfulness that has been confirmed in our heart. And the hope that we have in Jesus that we're trying to stand on in this firm foundation is only cemented even harder in our hearts. That we know that through this hope that we can trust God and know that he is good and he is faithful and he can use even our suffering, our suffering that maybe even we don't deserve can be used for his glory and for our good. You guys are probably familiar with a man named Michael Jordan. I'm assuming most of you know. Uh, he's kind of okay at basketball. Um, but uh, he, has, he tells us part of his story. He kind of, in, in many of you probably know this, he talks about when he was a sophomore in high school, um, how he was cut from his varsity basketball team. Here's arguably one of the greatest. You know, some of you might sit there and say, well, he is the greatest. Some of you will be like, no, that's LeBron James. Some of you might be Kobe Bryant. Some of you might say me. That's fine. Um, <laughs> But you look at, you know, we know Michael Jordan is one of the greatest basketball players of all time, and he was cut from his sophomore, vars as a sophomore, from his varsity basketball team. He a lot of times contributes to that difficulty, that season that he was going in, as part of his success in his future. Now, I'm not saying that we're like Christian Michael Jordans, but I am saying that there is something to be said about how you can use your suffering, how God can use your suffering to help you grow. Many people, if went through the same thing that Michael Jordan would say, oh, I guess basketball's not my thing and give up and quit. But instead, he took that to heart, worked harder, and ultimately grew and became one of, like I said, one of the greatest basketball players of all time. I believe God in, can use our suffering to grow us in our faithfulness, to grow us in our trust of him, to grow us in this foundation of hope that when we begin to even struggle or experience bigger things down the line that we're prepared for it and ready to face them no matter what and the key here i believe comes in verse 19 of this verse and this is how i'm going to close today how can we become a worshiper not a wanderer how can we become you know a uh somebody who is a contributor not someone who's just looking to consume how can we rejoice in even the difficult seasons of life not reject god and reject them what well, comes down to i believe one word trust you know certainly hope is one thing but hope teaches us when God confirms like our hopes are real in him, that we can trust him more. It says this, therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. How can we rejoice in suffering when uh, sometimes we have blinders on, right? When we always see is the pain in front of us. Well, it comes down to trust. We've seen that God is faithful. He's been faithful to bringing Jesus as the son of God to, to this earth living a sinless life who is willing to go to the cross uh, to bear the weight of our sin and then ultimately you know die be raised from the dead and now he sits at the right hand of God as our high priest interceding on our behalf God is faithful he is worthy of not just our hope but also our trust so as we close out let me just encourage you don't be a wanderer be a worshiper don't be a consumer, be a contributor. Don't reject the experiences you have, but rejoice in what God might be doing in your life to help you grow in him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word and how it guides us and it teaches us, Lord, and how it reveals to us who you are and who you've called us to be. Lord, help us, 
Lord, to, to reject living a life, Lord, out of the passions of our heart, Lord, but to seek you earnestly through your word, no, seeking to know your will that we might live obedient to you. Lord, help us to put on the mind of Christ, Lord, because we can't do this on our own in our own ability. We need you. So, Lord, uh, arm us to, uh, this day.